It's time for a Big Blue Kickoff Live. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it because you did. On Giants.com. You know what I saw? New York Giant Prime. And the Giants Mobile app. We'll punch you in the nose for 60 minutes with a relentless competitive attitude. Part of the Giants Podcast Network. Let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs having fun. Happy Friday, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live right here on Giants.com and the Giants mobile app. John Schmelk, Paul Dottino with you. The phone number is 201-939-4513 or hashtag Giants Chat on Twitter if you want to get in touch with us that way. You certainly can. Practice number three for the New York football Giants is in the books, Mr. Dottino, and it was the first day they were in shells after the first two practices, just in jerseys and shorts. Yes, that's right, John. Uh, we continue with the ramp-up process, as uh, Coach Joe Judge likes to call it. And, again, they won't be in full pads and doing hitting and everything that you would usually see on the football field until Tuesday. In fact, tomorrow uh, will be a jog-through. So, you know, this is a team that is still right now stressing an awful lot of conditioning and just going through the fundamental motions as opposed to, I, I don't want to say real football, but I think you guys get the gist of it. Yeah, and Paul, I think this is a good time. Why don't we kind of talk a little bit about what we've seen these first three days of practice and and sum it up. We've talked a little bit about what's happened in practice each after the first two days, but remember, these practices all happen one day at a time. It's a ramp-up period. There's Mm -hmm. There's no pads. There's no full contact. And these guys are just getting into the flow here. So I didn't want to kind of pick apart each one of these practices each day because I don't think it's fair to the players, but I think we can kind of talk in more of a wide swath here. Why don't we just go back and forth and kind of just talk about some things that have jumped out to us throughout these first three days. We've been in each of the three practices, and we'll go from there. Does that sound good? Yeah, well, I I think if it's okay with you too, John, I'd like to give the fans a little bit of an idea of what we're seeing in terms of the sessions too. Well, of because course, I, I don't think, about. yeah. Oh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I thought you were talking about talking about plays that we've seen and do what. I'm talking about the style of what we're seeing. Sure. We see some 11 on 11. So why don't we you see lead us off. Go ahead. Go well, ahead. We, we see some 11 on 11. We see some seven on sevens. We see some one on one drills with the defensive backs and the wide receivers. We'll see some one on one drills with the linemen. We'll see a lot of individual positional drills where guys are simply doing their drills with with their own groupings as opposed to going against anybody else. And and that makes up the bulk, besides the actual conditioning stuff, of what we're seeing. And that's why when John and I talk about these things, I want to be very clear, folks. A lot of times you'll see some observers who will just look at the 11-on-11s and they say, well, that's the closest thing to a game. So that's all they're really looking at, and that's what they will quantify when they talk about did so-and-so have a good practice or didn't he have a good practice. But I think it's important to remember that every one of these coaches is looking at the entire two-hour session and every single camera that the team has out on the field is looking at every single inch of that field. So these players are being evaluated on the full two hours. Their conditioning drills, their one-on-ones, their seven-on-sevens, the the red zone passing drills, which are ghost routes. All of this stuff is being evaluated. So if I characterize something or John characterizes something, we're giving you a complete picture as to how we felt about the entire operation that we saw. I think what gets quite confusing is there are those who, without identifying that they're only looking at the 11-on-11 team drills, they will make comments about that and basically ignore the rest of the practice, which, of course, is totally unfair, incomplete, and, and disingenuous. Now, a couple other notes, too, Paul, in terms of what we've seen so far. I mentioned the pads and the contact and the restrictions, and this is something Joe Judge mentioned today before we start talking about some of the actual things that are happening on the field, is that... Uh, To your point, this is still a ramp-up period, right? And this happened last year, too, where nearly all of the drills we've seen, except for a couple of seven-on-sevens, have basically been red zone opportunities. The first day, it was low red zone and goal to go. Day two was more high red zone, which is for the people that don't know is usually in that 10 to 20-yard area Mm -hmm. where you can still get a first down before you score a touchdown. So the Different types of routes you run are a little bit different. And then today they went back to more low red zone. And today was a shorter practice, too. It was only like an hour and 15 hour, you know, half maybe, give or take. Yeah, it's about an hour and a half, I think. It wasn't very long. And they did a lot of special teams work in there. So, and the reason they do that, frankly, is 
they don't want these guys, and Joe Judge hasn't talked about it this year, but I remember he talked about it last year, and it makes sense that their philosophy would would remain the same. Remember, this is a ramp-up period, and whenever you see guys in these practices, Paul, in the 40 years you've been doing this and the 20 years I've been doing this, or I guess 15, whatever, when guys hurt themselves with these soft tissues injuries in these practices— how often is it on a deep ball where they're reaching for a pass that's a little bit overthrown or really opening up on a deep route, and that's when they tweak something, right? Yes, so indeed. So I think the Giants, for the second straight year, for the first week, and I think this will probably start changing you know, early, mid-next week, they're not letting these guys open up for long, prorated, full sprints because they're trying to protect them from getting hurt. We, I don't think I've seen a pass travel more than 20 yards in the air, probably all camp so far. Maybe one of those little floaters to the back corner of the end zone might have been in the air, you know, 20 to probably 25 yards. Probably no more than that. Maybe, but definitely, Maybe. but definitely nothing over 30, right? That's no, for sure. No, absolutely not. So this is all happening in a compressed space. So I'm going to make a statement here that I think is true, which is, by the way, true for pretty much almost every training camp that I've covered. Early in camp, and we were joking about this being a, you know, pun, for lack of a better um, way, or a figure of speech that gets repeated over and over again, a colloquialism, if you will, at practice today. Well, it's early in camp, and the defense is ahead of the offense. Well, yes, it's like that in every camp, but I think— Of course it is. It's, uh, they a, also know the plays, John. Well, right, and, well, and it also <laughs> takes the offense a little bit longer to get into a rhythm while the defense can, can do things on an individual basis a little bit better right away, right? I think there's more yeah. rhythm and coordination required for an offense to run fluidly. But the point I'm trying to make here is that in a year like this, it's— even more obvious because of what they're trying to ask the offense to do. For the people that don't understand this, it's a lot tougher to pass successfully in the compressed areas of the red zone than it is when you have the full field to work with Mm -hmm. because you can't challenge guys over the top. So what does that mean? When defenders don't worry about an offensive player getting behind them, what does that mean? You can press them more at the line of scrimmage. You can be more aggressive. You can jump more routes. Why? The offense can't make a big play because there's no field to make a big play in because you're in the red zone. It's so, like playing a quarterback who has a rag arm. Right. You you know you can cheat. Correct. So that automatically gives the defense an advantage. Now, people are going to say, oh, Schmoke's making excuses. Ah. Well, no, I'm not. Ma- and that was my whining imitation, by the no, way. No, no. People um, just have to understand right. the purpose and the circumstances under which these guys are operating. And if you don't have the experience or the educated eye to truly understand it, you're going to give out misconceptions. Right. And look, uh, has the offense been super sharp and completing a bunch of passes on their own? No, they haven't. I'm not going to tell you that they have been, but given what they've been asked to do and the way the start of camp usually goes, that's okay. Don't freak out. It's not a big deal. And that's fine. It's been mostly short passes. There's been nothing down the field and again most everything has been red zone work so for the people that are panicking and i've seen some tweets that (laughs) the offense does not look great in the first three days it doesn't matter and by the way tomorrow's practice in newark that that the giants announced which will be great uh for the community it's not open to the fans but a bunch of you know kids and teachers and students and stuff like that from disadvantaged neighborhoods are going to be there which is fantastic that's going to be more of a jog through and then the first which practice, means not much is going to happen there either. Yeah, which means don't expect a, a, a ton of play-by-play coming your way from practice on Saturday night. And then Monday is going to be another shells practice, so we're probably not going to get our first like real deal practice. Paul, my guess is until Tuesday. All right, well, when we can really start having some determinations of what's going on. So I just wanted to put that out there too. You know, if fans are out there, like we haven't seen any like highlights of like big pass plays on on the on the on the Giants Instagram or Twitter or on the website. The highlights, why why aren't they throwing down the field? Well, that's because everything they're doing is in the red zone. That's mm-hmm. why. Just wanted mm-hmm. to get that out there. Now I will say this: of the three days we've seen so far, this was the best day the offense had. And and there have been certainly a couple of guys who have been very consistent in catching everything that's thrown to them. One is Kenny Galladay. I think I've seen him hit allow the ball to hit the ground once in three days. And, right, John? and by the way, 
And I'm talking about, by the way, in seven-on-sevens, 11-on-elevens, and ghost routes, and one-on-ones. Yes. Again, I'm grading everything. And I think he's let the ball go out of his hands once. And these have not been the most accurate passes sometimes either. There was one pass yesterday where it was behind them on a slant or a crossing route, and he basically had to turn his whole body and caught it with one hand. Mm -hmm. He went way over his head to catch it with one hand today. His... Out of all the things, and I'm happy you brought it up because I was going to bring it up if you did it, out of all the individual performers on offense so far this He's week. He's the guy who's opening eyes. His the, the his ability to just catch the football. He's really good. Look, he's not like the most sudden and quickest guy where he's getting all this separation. But again, you can't because you're in the red zone, so I'm not judging him on that yet. But the softness and consistency of his hands has been something that has really stuck out to me. You know, he was asked, were you there, John, when during his media veil today? Yeah, he didn't say a whole lot, but yes, I was there. Okay. <laughs> he was asked about contested catches. Yes, Paul And somebody Schwartz said to him, that. right, you're, you're so great at contested catches. What is the primary thing that you have to do to be so good at making contested catches? And I loved what his answer was. He goes, quote, it's about effort and want to. you got to want to make that play. I prefer to catch the football. I yeah, know. It's true. <laughs> no, you're right. 100%. <laughs> the man is like a machine. He's he's focused and he's determined and he's very businesslike and he's not going to let anybody have the ball. That's his ball and he really believes it. And don't you try to take it from me because I'll take it and run away. I mean, I uh, love the guy. But but so anyway, he's been sensational catching the ball over the first 3 days of camp. Uh, I also thought today we had a we saw a nice touchdown catch uh, on a fade to CJ Board. Yep. Uh, I also saw John Ross make a terrific catch, a sliding uh, just inside uh, the end zone. Now I missed that play, so can you give me an and just so you understand? It was in traffic over the middle. Okay, maybe that's why I missed it because it was between a bunch uh, of people. John, <laughs> the folks, they go to the far side of the field quite often during uh-huh. these practices. Which, which by the way, might be by design. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> And and while the guys who are not participating in the play decide they're going to stand and watch the play, they do so behind the offense, which is between the ball and the patio where we get to stand. So it's 80 yards away, plus you have a line of usually offensive linemen between us and, and the ball. The best and- way I could describe it, John? It's like the uh, restricted or obstructed views at Yankee Stadium. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and look, I, I want to apologize to fans because, as you guys well know, and Paul knows this when I usually do my practice reports, up until last year when the COVID restrictions came in, and, the, and they're still in, a lot of them are still in place this year for obvious reasons that we don't need to get into, but I used to be able to go right on the sideline, and I'm, you know, 30 yards away from Daniel Jones as he's snapping the ball, and there's no one in between me and the football, mm-hmm. and I could see everything, hear we everything, and just my ability to pass on information to you guys, which I love to do, it's why I love camp so much, was really unfettered, for for lack of a better term. This is a struggle. I mean, I, I have the policy is me. I have my binoculars up on every play. Oh, I know. But there are just... It's hard to see, and it's it's just tough to get into the nitty gritty details. I hope you're still enjoying those practice reports, but if you find them less detailed than usual, that's why because we well, are about <laughs> eighty yards away on a patio. Folks, there are times when we're walking all the way to the far side of the patio to get a better angle. <laughs> to see if we can somehow see around the line of players that are watching the ball from behind the line of scrimmage. It is it is quite an adventure to try to be able to see, but in any event... And by the way, this is not me complaining. The rules of the no. rules are there for a good reason. I get it. I'm just explaining why maybe some of the stuff we're giving you isn't as detailed as it normally is. Exactly. That's and the, o- the other uh, offensive uh, receiver who made a really terrific play, contested diving touchdown grab by David Sills as well today. Uh, during the team drill. So, again, the offense made their share of plays today, not maybe quite as many as the defense, but but it was the best day the offense has had so far, and both really had their fair share. And that's what happens when you grade the whole practice. The other item I wanted to mention real quick, John, Mm -hmm. is that I think Devontae Booker, has shown very soft hands out of the backfield during the first three days. I think Corey Clement has too, to be honest. Yes, he has. Both those guys have actually. We we mentioned it's been a lot of short passes. Those have been two of the guys that have caught a lot of those passes. I agree with you 100%. A couple other notes. You had interceptions today. Um, Rodarius Williams had one on a fade route. Logan Ryan had one on a pass intended for Evan Ingram. 
Uh, wasn't. I know people want to say, oh, did Ingram drop it and tip it up in the air? No, nope. he did not. So don't blame Evan on that one. That was more of a quarterback situation. Um, just a little bit of an overthrow on a little bit of a, of a fade route. A uh, couple other notes. Montreal- Dory Jackson had one, too. I, I No, he picked up a fumble, a strip, and started running it back the other way, right? There were two uh, interceptions and then the one yes, strip. Yes, yes, that's correct. I have him down for a yes, turnover. Correct. Right, yes. that's what I meant. I meant to say he had a turnover. Yes, he did. That's okay. And Julian Love had a really sweet pass defense, knocking a ball away from Pettis in the end zone. And he he's, he's had a few of those. Jabril Peppers has gotten his hands on a couple of balls. Montre Hardage has gotten his hands on a couple of balls. We mentioned um, Chris Milton yesterday. I know. Got a, got, got a nice <laughs> deflection. So the Giants' secondary has been very active. And the other thing I'll mention too, Paul, is that today – Unless I missed it the first two days, which is possible, because like I mentioned, this happens far away from us sometimes. We had our first set of offensive and defensive line one-on-ones today. Yes. While seven-on-seven seven was going on. Now there's no pads here, so take it with a grain of salt. Don't get too much into it. Right. But I, I thought the defensive line, I, I saw uh, Afadi Odenabo have a nice rush off the edge. I saw, I'm trying to think, who had the rush off a right tackle that I was happy with. I don't quite remember. But there were a couple of nice rushes there where the defensive line showed their ability to get into the backfield. Yeah, John, I I will tell you, I glanced at that drill because I think when you have one-on-ones without pads, it's it's almost not just unfair, but but it's almost insane (laughs) to try to take anything from that. Right, I know. You know, because let's face it, <laughs> if you're in shells, that's that's not what these guys do. <laughs> it's no. not part of their usual armor, so to speak. So I, I yeah, I I didn't see much, you know, so much there that was worth uh, worth a whole lot. Well, I was standing with Salmon. So Danny, watch the seven on sevens for me. I'm gonna watch the uh, I, again. I know you guys. Well, you get the tag team. I you and I do that sometimes, but you and Dan do more. Well, you're more than happy to stand with us, Paul. I, no one's I know. You can't well, I'm, stand with us. I'm moving around trying to get an angle. No, I I know <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. All right, we got a bunch of calls. Then we'll go through what was said in media availabilities. I don't think there's much. Oh, we should mention Shane Lemieux first, Paul. That's the one that we did not. Oh mention yes. Yet. I, yes. should, I should have mentioned that off the top. So Shane Lemieux, Joe Judge said they'll know more in 24 to 48 hours, uh, but it appears that the worst result has been avoided. Yes. And then, which made us feel even better about it, is that Shane Lemieux was out there on the practice field. He wasn't practicing, but he was with the trainers. Uh, there was no, like, big brace or ice pack or wrap on the leg. He was lifting Nothing. weight. So Nothing. The You're early right. returns look positive, and we'll see what the official – uh, diagnosis is than what we hear from Joe Judge either tomorrow or on Monday. So yeah. good news, and a lot of people were freaking out about that yesterday. So you can calm down. It appears to be okay. Yes, he did a lot of uh, upper body conditioning drills and upper body strength drills with the trainers off to the side. Uh, but like you said, John, he was walking, and there was nothing on his legs. And look, you well, and I have been around well, a long well, time. There were shorts on his legs. I just want to be clear about that. Okay. <laughs> It is a family program. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Although people kind of practices, people think the Giants are running out there. Uh, correct, yes. correct. Uh, the, the point being, though, and again, John mentioned it, it is extremely significant that when a guy gets injured or dinged up, if you see him back out there on the field with the trainers, that tells you, A, he's not inside getting treatment, which is never a good sign, and B, he's not going off to some doctor or hospital to get a second opinion right away, which is also never a good sign. Nope. So nope. so this is definitely positive for Shane Lemieux. All right, let's get to the phones, Paul, because we got a full bank of calls, and then we can touch on some of the media availability stuff in between some of these calls. I don't think there was a ton that was super significant during media today, but we can Not touch really. on it. Limited Giants season tickets are on sale now for the 2021 season. In addition to ticket savings, membership benefits include access to exclusive events, experiences, pre-sales, and more. You can lock in your seats starting at just 100 bucks. Call 888 888- NYG 1925, or visit Giants.com slash tickets for more information. 201-939-4513. All right, let's go to John in Arizona. He's going to lead us off today. What's up, John? Hey, guys. How you doing? It's Sean. Oh, I'm sorry, Sean. What's up? Hi. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Uh, long-time listener, first time to be able to call and talk to you guys, so thanks for taking the call. Well, welcome aboard, and, thank, and, and thank you for being such a loyal listener. What do you got? Absolutely. Hey, I want to give my bold prediction, but quick, I wanted to ask real um, just a little bit about the defense. I've been hearing some other folks put in their bold predictions. Uh, most recently, one said that uh, Darnay Holmes may have the most interceptions. But if Patrick Graham really wants to move to more of a man-to-man defense, isn't it more difficult 
to get interceptions in man-to-man defense, so therefore the safeties will probably have more interceptions? Yes. I, Sean, I agree okay. with that completely. Mm-hmm. I think that is a good um, analysis of it, yes. That's why some okay, of these good. things are truly bold. And, well, yes. <laughs> and and that's, why we, that's why when we did our predictions, my top two interception getters for the Giants were both safeties. Correct. There you go. My bold prediction, so this bold prediction, I'm hoping it's pretty bold, but for the first time in 25 years since 1997, the New York Giants head coach will be named Coach of the Year. Oh, okay. That's not bad. And I, and I think a lot of things have to go right for that to happen. <laughs> so, Well, bottom uh, line, excited, you know, your bottom line, Sean, and, and, and then you can finish and, and continue, obviously, with whatever points you have. If that's going to happen, the Giants win the division. Because if the Giants don't win the division, he's not getting coach of the year. No. Right. Exactly. And to win the division, we need offensive line to play well. We need Daniel Jones to play well. We need everything to happen uh, and really see growth. We need to see Joe Judge and his teacher mentality really come through and big jump in a lot of these young players and big jump in talent and the way we play out in the field. So I'm hoping that all those things come true and we get to see Joe Judge named uh, coach of the year. That'd be great. Sean, you got something else for me? You're good. That's it. I'm good. Thanks, guys. Hey, thanks for listening. Thanks for being part of the show, man. Hey, look, and that's what's going to happen. You know, I hate linking player value to record and team success because I don't think that's fair. But for coaches, to an extent, if you want to win one of these big-time coaches award, Paul, you better have a pretty darn good record. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt because what happens is the good teams, right, they already have a leg up because they're probably going to win their division. And then if they win 13 or 14 games, well, it's almost impossible for a guy with a lesser team, even if he gets them out of the doldrums and into playoff contention, or for that matter, even wins a wild card, they're going to say, well, wait a minute. It's really hard to win 14 games in this league. Right. So they'll go to that coach that won the 14 games, even though he's got a much better roster, and say, well, 14 games is still 14 games. You get the award. And then the poor guy who, you know, had to break his back to drag his team into the playoffs kind of gets left by the wayside. Yeah, and you also just have to overperform expectations, right? If you're not going to be that 14-win team, you have to be a team that everyone expected to win five games, but you win 11. So I think the Giants, I think, are probably people figure around seven for them this year. That would be the general consensus, right, if you want to look at, you know, some of the numbers that are out there. So for them to really overperform that, I think you're looking, if Joe Judge wants to be considered for Coach of the Year, Paul, I think you're probably looking at probably 11 wins they'd have to get to. If he wants to be considered for that, you think that's fair? You'd have to go 11-6 uh, and it, six at minimum? I think it's probably fair to say that would get him in the ballpark. But again, it, it depends more on what his competition's going to be than yeah, what he does. No, that's true, too. But I think in order for him to be considered, I think you have to kind of get to that. 11 plateau for him to be in the mix. Is yeah, my point. He, he probably would have to. Although, I mean, 10 is not know. impossible. Would 10, but... and, would 10 and 7 do it if they win the division and win some key games against some of the better opponents? You would have Maybe? to. Maybe? Or, yeah, you would have to, I think, to your point, not have another compelling candidate out there. Right. And and like I said, if if somebody goes out and wins fourteen games, or wins, right. in this in this case seventeen game season, if they win fifteen and go fifteen and two, that'll be the first coach who goes fifteen wins during the regular season. Well, I know they're the fifteen and one team and the, and the and the other undefeated teams, but in the new schedule, if somebody goes fifteen and two, right, that guy's going to get a lot of pop. No, I'm with you. Two zero one nine three nine four five one three. Let's go to Tyler in Charleston. He joins us next. Hey, Tyler. Hey, what's going on, guys? What's up, boss? Um, yeah, I was just calling because I had a quick question regarding Evan Ingram. Sure. Um, so, like, I know, uh, I know you guys don't like setting expectations for players, which I mean, I 100 percent understand. Oh, that's but fine. I mean, guys- I mean, I mean, I mean, Tyler, we 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 sat here for two straight days and set over unders for players' stats lines. So that's fine. That's True. not a problem. <laughs> Go ahead. So, I mean, I was that's just okay. Reaching out to you guys, one friend, because I'm not sure what a fair expectation for Evan Ingram actually is. Because everyone talks <sighs> about every single year about the potential he has, which I agree 100% with. I'm just – I want to be fair. You know, I don't want to expect him to go out there and be Travis Kelsey, but I also don't want him to go out there and, you know, basically put out the show what he did last year, you know. So I just want to know for the fans what would be a fair, you know, expectation for him going into the season. Are you looking for, like, a – 
like basic description of the type of year, or are you looking for like hard and fast numbers? Uh, like basic description, like contribution, what we expect him to contribute to the offense, you know, what like what role we expect him to have, you know, like how much of a role player will do we expect him to be, things like that. And I'll take this off the air. All right, appreciate the call, man. Thanks so much. All right, well, I can tell you what we set our over-unders for for him, and that'll give you a statistical basis for Ingram, if I can find it here. Here we go. So we set for Ingram over-under for yards at 685, catches at 65, and touchdowns at 3. And most of us selected over for most of those from what no we most people selected under we for receptions under and yards yes but three people went over on the touchdowns for three so that's where we set the statistical one for me this is where i'm at with ingram because the giants have so many options to throw the ball to paul it's almost as if the raw numbers aren't super important but i want to see more big plays down the field Challenging down the seam, right? I thought his yards per attempt and yards per catch specifically were too low the last couple of years. So I want to see him, especially with Kyle Rudolph, I think, being more of that short to mid-range possession guy. I want to see Ingram stretch the field a little bit. And I want to see Ingram, when the ball's thrown to him in these key situations, to catch it. And if he can do those two things, even if the run numbers drop, I think that's a successful season because then he becomes that type of player, if you get him in the right matchup, can make teams pay with big plays and in crucial situations. And if he can be that guy, I think that's what you're looking for. You know, I think the standard for me, for Evan Ingram, is really kind of what John's saying. Because for me, there's only one thing I want to know about Evan Ingram. What is his catch percentage at the end of the season? And he has only reached 70% in terms of his catch percentage once back in 2018 in his second NFL season. To and by, you, by the way, for people know, catch percentage is receptions versus targets. Just correct. so people understand where Paul's coming from here. Right. So, I mean, if here's the thing, okay? If you want to grade a receiver or a tight end or a running back on their drops, it's never really acceptable to have a drop percentage of more than 6%. Okay? that You want 6% or less Anything above 6% drops is really not good. All right? That's agitated territory. Yeah, you're right. Big time. And Evan Ingram has been over 6%. Okay, that's number one. But you see, the other thing for me, I don't want to go with the number of drops or the drop percentage. I want to go with the catch percentage. Because, you see, if they throw the ball to him a lot, That means those plays aren't going to somebody else who might make a play. So I need him to have a catch percentage of over 70% so that I know not only is he making the play and finishing it by hauling the ball in, but I want to know that, hey, it was worth throwing it to him because that play was in fact made and they didn't waste it because somebody else could have made the play. Now, by comparison, John, Kyle Rudolph has had a catch percentage of at least 70% in each of the last four seasons and five times during his career with the Vikings. I need to see that type of efficiency out of Evan Ingram to say, you know what, he is being the type of, of productive tight end that the Giants need in this offense. Just so people understand, last year, Ingram tied his career high for 68 catches, but it took 111 targets from him to get there. The year prior, he had 46 catches, but only on 69 targets. So just to give you an idea of exactly where he has been the last couple of years in terms of percentages, I think, look, I think if you combine your concept of efficiency, right, catch efficiency, with what I was talking about, Paul, with explosive plays and making those plays in the big moments when you oh, need yeah. them. You combine those, it's a good thing. Oh, I mean, if you combine those, <laughs> I mean, you're talking Travis Kelsey territory. <laughs> no, I'm serious. and like, I know. I mean, he has the potential to do that if he can get there, but I think those are two good things to kind of keep an eye on when you keep an eye on Evan Ingram this year. 201-939-4513. Don't miss out on your chance to experience a premier hospitality experience watching Giant games and world-class concerts in 2021 as a Giant Suite partner. Limited full-season locations are available or a place to deposit for individual games. Call 
NYG1925 or visit Giants.com slash suites for more information. All right, back to the phones. Let's say what's up to Antonio in Manhattan. He joins us next. What's up, Ant? Hey, what's going on, guys? It's been a long time since I spoke to you, so glad to speak to you guys again. Yeah, welcome back. Hi. Um, so just wanted to talk first and foremost about uh, Judge, Coach Judge. Um, dude, I, I, I love this guy, man. Like, uh, the, when he was talking about he uses colorful languages to emphasize things and how he wouldn't curse in front of, you know, your mom or your daughter, your kids. <laughs> I, listen, this coach reminds me of when I played high school ball and my coach was just the same way. And he's the closest thing that we've had to Coach Coughlin in terms of, like, personality. I need Coach Judge to succeed in the Giants. It's just I want this guy to stay here for, for a decade at least. So I, hopefully um, it works out for him. Um, and, and what I wanted to call is, because you guys, I, I kind of heard you guys uh, talk about the over-unders, and you guys listed Daniel Jones in touchdowns. At what amount you guys pretty much agreed on? The over-under on Jones's touchdown throws? Correct. I think, Correct. I think the number we had was 28. I got that here. Hold was on. Was it, John? I'm, you guys got to flip back to my page here. I, I left it well, for a second. Hold on. You two guys, go, did you guys look on that? Uh, I could tell you our over or under on Daniel Jones touchdown passes. We actually put it pretty high. We added a twenty nine and a half. Okay. Yeah. I knew it was up there. And all four of us had under on that, by the way, just FYI. Right. Because so I think I think I, I had said he would be just under. He would he would probably come in something like twenty seven or twenty eight. I had him at twenty but I think I had him at twenty eight this year, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. So my only concern with that number is I believe the Giants in order to win the division or even go far he needs to average about 50 touchdowns or real close to 50 touchdowns. I think Daniel Jones has to have over 30 and maybe around 35 touchdowns. And if he doesn't have around 35 touchdowns at the end of the year. Um, now, remember, I that, remember that's, Antonio, that's just throwing touchdowns now. That is not including right, rushing touchdowns. Just right, FYI. Yeah, but he's, he's probably going to have like about five rushing touchdowns. If, if that, I mean, that would be a good, if he has five rushing touchdowns, that's a good season. That's a great season. Sure, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, he he has to have over 35, in my opinion, throwing passing touchdowns. Now, Antonio, to I just have. want to make sure you understand. Do you know how many quarterbacks yeah. had more than 35 passing touchdowns last year? How many? Five. But that's a good amount. That, that's a, well, no, that, the, no, no, that, that's no, 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 that, that is not a good amount. That is an <laughs> elite amount. That is yeah, a no. dude, dude. I'm just telling you. Right. Do you want who the five guys were that had thir- had more than 35 touchdowns? It was uh, the Bills. Josh Brady, Allen. Yep. Rogers. Brady. Yep. Yeah. Rogers. Yep. Two more. See if you can get them. <laughs> um, Mahomes. Yep. That's four. Give me the fifth one. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the guy from the Chargers. No, Russell Wilson was five. <laughs> you know, he, here's the thing I'd like you to keep in mind when you start thinking about these numbers. And, and by the way, those guys are literally might be the five best quarterbacks. Yeah, right. Just FYI. Um, <laughs> oh, no, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, if, if Jones throws 28 touchdowns, right, and the yeah. Giants, uh, and we believe they're going to try to run the ball more, and if they can right. do that effectively, especially in the red zone, well, guess what? There were 10 teams in the National Football League last year that ran for a minimum of 20 touchdowns. And by the way... And you just said you wanted 50 touchdowns, right? Well, what's 20 and 48? Uh, 20 and uh, 28 and 20 is 48. That's pretty damn close. Yeah, that that would be really good. That would be good. But you guys also set Saquon's touchdown rushing pretty low, too. So it's going to be a lot of... uh, uh, I put it at ten and a half. Hitting. What's wrong with ten and a half? <laughs> that's that's not that low. Ten and a half is oh, pretty okay. good. That's a decent I you guys number. Went all under. Uh, we did pick under, but that doesn't mean he's not going to get like nine or something like that. I right. mean, ten and a half is a good number. Yeah, no, that would be great. Yeah. So, uh, just just one thing. I here's here's my bold prediction for the season. Okay. Uh, and and I'm gonna. I'm going to get a lot of Giants fans mad, but my hope, Andrew Jones won't be the quarterback by week seven of that. Of the, what, is the trade deadline is week seven or week eight? Andrew Jones? No, you lost a, me. no, he's a Daniel Jones. Da- Daniel oh, Daniel Jones. Jones. Daniel Jones. I'm sorry. I thought you said Andrew yeah. Jones. I'm no. like, that's a baseball call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, Daniel Jones won't be quarterback for this team by by the trade deadline if uh, if 
if, if again, if, if I don't see the touch, if the touchdowns are not there, I don't see him finishing out the season. Well, but where are they going to get a quarterback? So you they want gotta, Mike Glennon to, to finish listen, up the we season? Have two, we have we, we have draft picks or something. I don't know. They're going to. Well, you you want you want you want to trade the picks for a veteran is what you want to do. It could be, yeah, it could In be, it could be that we might see Watson. Yeah, mid season. Yeah. And and exactly what good do you think that's going to do? Yeah. I'm not trying to be funny, but how does that help? No. Well, if you bring in, I mean, a more talented quarterback. To be honest, uh, listen, All right. everybody's uh, blaming this offensive look. line as the worst offensive line. Look, Honestly, I, I, my I, problem was that I, I'm, 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 I'm kind of having a little fun pocket. with you here. But if Daniel yeah. Jones does so poorly that the right. Giants need to move off of him, chances yeah. are that you could bring back Johnny Unitas and he won't save the season over the second half of the schedule. Right, because if he's so bad that he ends up getting – and again, this is not us predicting this, just us no. commenting on the hypothetical. That means yeah. they're probably like 2-5, and five, right? And if you're 2-5 and, yes. and you make – or, you know, whatever, and if you make that trade, the odds you bring somebody in that's good enough, that's going to get used to do what they need him to do, to bring the team yeah. back to the playoffs – look – if, if there's a crash and burn scenario, which Paul and I don't think there's going to be, that's something that you're probably going to address after the season, and it's not going to be something yeah. you address midseason. You really don't have any choice. No, it's hard. Don't, I mean, how many times do teams trade for a new quarterback midseason and it, like, works and propels that's them true. to the that's playoffs? Never, I don't, yeah, I don't think I've seen that. Look, I'll no. tell you what I'm going to do. I'll get you Drew Brees' phone number. Thank you, Antonio. And if you Appreciate feel like you want to call him in the middle of the season, you can do that if you like. By the way, Paul, I should ask you, um, yes. did, were there any bold predictions yesterday? Because I had to walk out of the show for about 15, 20 minutes, and I, so I wasn't here to record stuff. I was not on yesterday. No, I mean two days ago when it, when it was you and Lance. Oh, boy. I think we did have one, but I, uh, I think one or two callers may have offered some bold predictions, mm. but I didn't jot them down. Okay. No worries. What about Pe- hey, Pearson? Are you there? Yeah, Pearson's listening. Did, did, he, did he maybe catch him? Yeah, I don't think Pearson wrote any bold predictions. Okay. Down. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> no, hey, I know, I know. It's you know, I think that kind of just slipped through the cracks. <sighs> you and Lance, you I'm sorry. You guys better, I didn't man. know I was supposed to have pen and paper ready. Knock. I I need to put you through one of our intern uh, oh, seminars. Oh You, know? you always know. have pen and paper ready. Come yes, on, man. Yes, yes, I know. But yeah, look. To Antonio's point, fifty touchdowns. I mean, that I guess puts you automatically at twenty-one points per game. And that's before you take field goals into consideration. And I guess you probably kick on average. I mean, a field goal kick over the course of the year, Paul, usually kicks like, what, like 25 to 30 field goals, give or take? Well, Gano was 31 out of 32 okay. last year. So figured, can I say safely two field goals a game, or is that being a little bit too aggressive? I think that's about right. Uh, well, here's, here's the way I think I would so that's I look it at it. If you look at it, three touchdowns a game and then two field goals a game, that's 27 points. I mean, that is right. like really, really top of the line. Well, fantastic. No, 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 no. 27 points. If you average 27 points a game, that will get you top 10 in the league because the Las Vegas Raiders scored 27 points a game last year. They were 10th in the NFL. Really? They were only 10th last year at that number, yes. huh? Okay. Yes. Interesting. Green Bay and Tampa were the only two teams that averaged 30 points or more per game. And Buffalo was just a tad under 30. And then you'd have to go all the way down to Minnesota at 11 to get under 27. And really, it was 26.9, as I'm looking at yeah, it right you're now. Right. Because the Raiders, I wanted to be accurate. Yeah, the Raiders were 10th, and, and and look, Minnesota was at 26.9. So they were right. basically 27 basically points per game. Same. So, yeah, look, you're right. I, I didn't think the numbers were that high. All right, fair enough. So it comes down to the median average offense is going to score, if you if you divide this up as the median, which is the middle team, Atlanta was 16th at 24.8 points per game. And Dallas How much was again? Seven, what was the number again? 24.8, and Dallas was 24.7. Yeah. They were 16th and 17th, respectively. Yeah, if you can get to 24 points per game this year, I That's think I'd gotta be go. happy with that. I, I, I Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you, John. I don't think it's too much to ask this team to get to 24 a game. I really don't. No, I not mean, with I don't the think firepower they added. No, I think I, I think that's a realistic goal, and that'll put them right smack in the middle of the league. Which would be and a, that's yeah, absolutely. Which would and be if you got a nice top ten jump. defense, right? Right, you got a top ten defense, even well, if it's if, on the fringe mm-hmm. and, and a middle offense, you're going to go to the playoffs. You got a shot at it for sure. Sure, no question about it. Two zero one nine three nine four five one three. Maurice in Georgia, I think, has been on the longest, right? Pearson, Mont- uh, Maurice, what's going on? 
How are you? We're good, Mo. Hi. What's going Afternoon, on, buddy? Gentlemen. Thank you. I'm well. I'm well. First time caller, long time listener. Oh, welcome aboard. Uh, Thank you. I, <laughs> I have a bold prediction to start off. Sure. Um, it is Saquon Barkley will win Comeback Player of the Year and League MVP. Whoa! The first one, I'm like, all right, good, but not Super Bowl. But you put the exclamation point on that one. Holy smokes. Yes. I- I'm going to assume yes. you believe he will start and play a full 17-game schedule. I think this man is coming back to prove something, and he wants to be the greatest. And and that's instilled in him, and that's just that drive that he has. And he's coming back to prove something. So anybody who doubts him, Get out of his way. Well, Maurice, he's, I will say this. Much, much like with the judge prediction earlier, to get the MVP as a running back, your team better be darn good. So the Giants, well, again, be- better better win that defense. division. We have a darn good defense. Sure. And I, I, I believe in that defense. But I called about Daniel Jones. Well, Maurice, before you um, go on to Daniel Jones, let me just add one other thing, and I don't want to throw cold water on you, but... Wow, usually, but usually I'm the one throwing cold water. I know. I, I, I like but, the reverse but, of but this. But, Maurice... Uh, you can't shake me. You can't shake <laughs> me. Well, I'm, here's the I'm, thing. I'm, You're 100% I'm, 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 right I'm, I'm, about Barkley's attitude. He is very intense. He's very driven. And he is yes. doing everything on the face of this earth to come back and be a superstar again. But here yeah. is the one thing that you're leaving out of your equation. The Giants medical staff is looking long-term with him. And if they decide that he'll be on a pitch count early in the first few weeks of the season, or even for that matter, if he should miss the first game or two, that's going to significantly inhibit his overall numbers when you're talking about an MVP candidate. And that has nothing to do with I, I, him. I that has to do with the Giants' medical staff. Well, I, I understand that, and I'm I'm looking at it from the fans' perspective, and what he is going to bring to the table. Okay, his leadership, his tenacity, his well, it's all good. It's all it good, done. my friend. I'm, I'm with he, you. It's all he's good. A hundreds on all of those. Ah, uh, okay. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> I don't care if it's week two, week three, if it's week four. When he gets back in there, look out. What do you have on Jones for us, Look out. Okay, Daniel Jones, he, his interceptions in the past have come under duress. He's been pressured and pressured. I am worried that this being year three and all this outside pressure on him to perform is going to have him making more mistakes. I, I'm more. I'm closer to the previous caller than to Paul with the faith in Daniel Jones. I am probably a part of the 10 percent of the fan base that really didn't like the draft pick, still don't care for the draft pick, but he's our guy, and we're going to go with him. But the, the pressure in the game, he's lost some, and I'm, I just want to know where you guys are at with that because the, there's a lot more pressure on him from the outside looking in has he quieted those demons is he is he flushed it out of his system because there was a few games where he was driving and it looked good and then boom balls with the other team game over I don't worry about him mentally Maurice I got to be honest with you I don't I think from a mental perspective approach perspective He's not a guy to me that kind of, you know, struggles in big spots. He he's, he's always stays very level. That, for me, is not a concern for him. I think it, it's pretty simple. Can he increase his number of big plays while limiting his turnovers? That's number one. And I think the other part of it, too, is just be more consistent in your decision-making, getting the ball out quickly, which I think, you know, naturally improves as a quarterback gets more snaps. But it's the limiting the turnover-worthy plays and improving your big-time throws to, to steal PFF terms. And, you know, just if you can do those things and you're Daniel Jones, you're going to be better. And, look, this is a no-turnover, big-play league. That's how you win football games now. You win the turnover battle. Absolutely. You make more big plays than the other team. Not, maybe not 90%, but 75% of that is on the quarterback. So if he can get better right. in those areas, I think he'll be fine Mentally, I'm not that concerned with it, to be honest with you. I have faith that he's a pretty, really solid kid that way. 
So that's how I'm going to look at Daniel Jones a lot this year as to whether or not he can take that next step. Me personally, I know Paul looks at it a little bit differently than I do. Well, Maurice, I can calm you down just a little bit. And I understand that quoting I statistics so. by themselves <laughs> are never, never good ideas. OK, I, I don't like to do that myself either, because I'm always the one who says peel back the layers of the onion and look at all the angles within the prism. But it is relevant to say that Daniel Jones, over the course of the second half of the season, had gone his last five starts prior to the Dallas game without throwing an interception. And then the interception in the Cowboys finale was a tip ball off of Evan Ingram's hands. So that's one pick over Daniel Jones' final six starts. Now listen, I'll say this. There were probably three or four throws during that period of time that he may have been fortunate on that potentially could Probably. have been picked. But the, the <laughs> fact does remain. You're being generous. Uh, well, but the fact remains they weren't. And, and exactly. you know, for a guy who had 10 interceptions for the season but only threw one during his final six starts, you know, you, you have to be able to digest that. Well, and by the way, and, and I will give you a completely unbiased number here. I know Paul doesn't like this number, but I'm going to give it to Maurice because I think he might appreciate it. So – Last year, Daniel Jones, according to Pro Football Focus, had 17 turnover-worthy plays, right? So plays that either wound up in a turnover or should have wound up in a turnover. Is that fumbles or picks it's or to combine? Combined together. They, they say combined. Yes. And it was 31 in 2019. It was down all the way to 17 last year. So that's a big decrease to begin with, right? But if you break down right. last year, Maurice, his final six games, he only had six turnover-worthy plays versus in his first eight, when he had 11. So that pace, according to PFF, also slowed down. Now, that's a sample size thing, but you are seeing improvements in his ability to protect the ball no matter how you want to cut it. I agree. I agree. They they did. The turnovers did go down. but got to let the facts speak for themselves, my friend. That's all. Well, just let no, the facts speak for themselves. It's the, the game that the turnovers come in is – Whoa, 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 hold on! Right. Oh no, no, Maurice, don't go there. You're such a good guy, man. I don't want, I don't want to have to, to make you go back, but I gotta make no, you take a no, back step. A... You know why? No, let me tell you why. No, you're extra hard on Ingram for the drop. Here's but... the thing. No, but here's the thing. You're talking about in big spots. Could it have been any bigger that the Giants were in quicksand? And they were fighting for their lives over the final month and a half of the season in a division that was struggling. And they were in a do or die every single Sunday. I mean, every they day. had to win every game. Even and they, they wound up, you know, going, what, five and three over the final eight, right? Well, right? I mean, you know, come on. We just gave you his statistical improvement, which is factual based on either the analytics guys or my guys, were both pointing in the same direction, and those games were the most critical games of Daniel Jones's career. And I will just throw in, in addition, and again, okay. I, and Maurice, just real quick, I, I, I'm going to throw the PFF numbers in there just to back up some of the stuff that Paul said. In his final six starts, four of those six – were the four out of the five highest graded games he had over the course of the year. Now, he had two stinkers in there. Like, he was not good against the Cardinals, right? That was okay. not and a good game for him. And he nope. shouldn't have played. Absolutely, and that's fine. And against the Ravens, he was okay. He was not great, but he, right. was, he was okay. But, again, the Cowboys' defense stinks in the final week. I get that. And the Bengals' defense stinks, and I get that in week 12. But he, in those in the, towards the end of the year... His play became better and more consistent. Now, again, it's a small I'm, – I'm, I'm being fair about this. It's a small sample size. So we now have to see how that heads into this season. So I, I, I get your concerns. I think we saw signs of progress. But for me, probably a little bit more so than Paul, now it's time to prove – that that progress can be sustained over an entire season and a longer period of time. I, I Is concur. that fair? I, 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 I concur. I, I concur I'm just with you, John. From a guy that's just I'm more optimistic, but I concur. Football. Yes. Thank you, Maurice. Great call, man. Don't be a stranger. Really good call. Seriously. Thank you. Excellent call. It was. It was a very yeah. good call. See, now, and, folks, and we, this we is were the, able this... to toss and turn with the, uh, the various facts and opinions. Right. And, and you know what? If he still wants to agree to disagree and doesn't have a lot of confidence in Daniel, he's certainly allowed to do that. Yeah, but, th- but you know what, though? That is a that is a productive, fun, and interesting That was call. a great call. Because you guys, we all, you know, to a certain extent, we all disagreed. 
But you and him probably disagreed more than me and him did to an extent, right? In terms of 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 of, of how you yeah probably break this stuff down. But that's I, I'm fine. certainly more optimistic, right? But and, and and that's cool. But he had a point of view and statistics and ideas to back his thing up. He accepted our reason and the facts we threw up there, and we just drew slightly different conclusions. And you know what? That's okay. <laughs> it sure is. And and a lot of people in the world don't like to say that now. With, you can what agree comes to, a lot to of disagree. There's not a problem yes, with that. But as a, long as you acknowledge the facts right. that are truthful. And, and you have a good productive back and forth and yes. a good debate about it, which is, I think, exactly what that was. You so must folks, acknowledge the whole picture. Model yourself on Maurice. Good stuff. Excellent call. All right. 201 939 4513. Montreal, Miami. I want to go to one of our newer callers first. Montreal, nice. what's going on? Hey, how are you guys? We're great, man. Hi. What's up? Hi. Hey, you know, uh, I, I just don't understand uh, where guys they don't under they they just don't understand what Daniel Jones had to go through last year. As far as drops, less talented players he was playing against, and, and less talented players he was actually playing on his side of the field on his team, the Giants. And uh, what everyone has to understand is that. Players need to make plays for their quarterback. And Daniel Jones probably had the less plays made for him in the entire league. We have players now that's at the top of the league and making plays for their quarterback. So I think that's going to, by default, enhance the play of Daniel Jones. So I see that. I think that Daniel Jones is going to make a tremendous jump this year. Um, I think he's going to do great. I think he. I, I don't want to take it to the point to where I say break all-time records. But um, I think the Giants are going to do unbelievable better than than what they did last year. A lot of games last year was close as well. Um, like the Rams, you know, they, they were losing, what, by four points the entire game and lost by eight in the total. And but look what they had to play with, including guys dropping passes like uh, Darius Slayton and Evan Ingram, which is – a lot of guys don't understand Evan Ingram had those drop issues since since college. That was the main knock on him coming into the league is that he dropped a lot of passes in college. And, and, and in his so, first year with the Giants, he had he had around 12 drops, which is a lot. Mm-hmm. Exactly right. No, I, I, look, oh, but, but, but <laughs> since then, but since then it, it has gotten a lot better. Unfortunately, last year, some of those drops came in some pretty critical situations. Well, he had three it, that it, actually led exactly. to direct interceptions. So, yeah. Not to mention right, the drop exactly. in Philly that was in the most inopportune of times. It, thank you, and that's what I'm talking about. You, if Cal Rudolph is on the other side of that pass, Giants in the playoffs. Last well, see, my, my friend, uh, Montreal, this is exactly why what I said is what I said before about his percentage of targets and catches. Because I don't want that ball thrown to him in that spot if I can't be confident he's going to finish the play. I'd rather throw the ball to Rudolph. Exactly, and 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 that's what that. I, I hopefully, I I really hope that Giants uh, do that this year. When it comes to difficult situations and critical times, please try to get the ball as much as you can to Rudolph or or Galladay, and even Shepard. Shepard make uh, a lot of ton of plays too. But I, I don't know. It's just something. Uh, Darius Slayton had issues with dropping passes in college too at Auburn. Uh, even though I know he he make he makes some pretty uh, decent catches in, in the NFL now, but. I, I don't know. I, I just rather get rather get it to try to get it to the guys that you know for sure. There's a higher percentage chance of of making that play, and Mont- and uh, winning the game, and actually it makes Daniel Jones look good. Montreal. So, I've been talking about this on BBK now for months, and I mentioned it again to John today. The the common characteristic of the three weapons that the Giants added for Daniel Jones this year is that they will make plays for him. Tony, I think, had three drops in college during his entire career. He's got hands as soft as silk and cotton. He doesn't drop anything. Rudolph fights for the ball. He's amongst the best tight ends at contested catches, and we already know Galladay is the best wide receiver in the league at contested catches. So you're talking about three guys there who are all going to make plays for Daniel Jones when he throws the ball into their box. I mean, that, to me, I'm sorry. To me, I have to believe that Daniel Jones is going to take a big step when he's got those guys on the other end with their 
big hands and their big radius and their physical skill set that are going to say, Daniel, just chuck it over here, baby. I'll, I'll get the ball. That's my ball. Get it to me. I'll take care of you. Yeah, I'm, I, I agree with it. Hey, I'm, I'm riding that train as well. I'm right, right along with it. Do you have a bold my, prediction, bold prediction. Macho? Yes. Yes. Okay, my bold prediction. The Giants start off this year 7-0. and 7-0. Um, that's bold. That's yeah, what, yeah. That's one I, I word think, for it. But you know what, John? You know what, John and Paul? All these teams are very beatable teams by far. And, and I know you guys are going to say, oh, what about the Rams? But like I said, they were losing by four points with what they had last year the entire game and lost by eight points in total. Now the Giants have a totally different team with a lot of key players back. I think Giants can win that game. I think they can win it. Now, just, just just a fair question. So when you look at the Giants' entire schedule, you would have just say that two games are not winnable? Does no, that mean, does that mean you think that. they're going to go 15-2? and two? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait a minute, John. He's got them at 7-0. and oh. well, that's, well, that, I mean, that, so he's that's thinking, why I asked the question. That's right? why I asked so, the question. So that means 8-2 over the final part of the schedule, right? I think that's realistic, man. I think they're all winnable Whoa, games. Oh, man. Who? That's, that's not bold. I think that's money right there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Montreal. We got to run, pal. Call again. Good stuff, man. Awesome, awesome call. <laughs> All right, let's wrap it up with it with an oldie but a goodie. Mark in Chicago will be our final call. What's up, Mark? Hey, guys. I have uh, three bold predictions I'd like to make. Okay. And uh, as I was on the line, I was, you know, I wanted to predict that we were going to score 405 points a game, which is 24 points. And you said that would be right at the average. So I'm going to up my bold prediction. Yes. And I'm going to say we are going to go 465 points, which is 27 and a half points. A okay. Game. I'll take that. That's, I think right. that's bold. Don't yeah. you agree, Paul? 465? Yeah, yeah that, that, that's going to take you a little bit higher onto the rankings. Yep. To, to me, honestly, Mark, I, I think that's probably a little bit much. So I agree that it's a bold prediction. I don't know that they mm-hmm. have to do that to be a playoff team. Right. I agree. But you want bold, so I'm giving you bold. Okay. Here's my second bold prediction. Week 16, we are going to give a beat down to Philadelphia by 27 points or more. 27? Beat Philly by 27 plus on December yes. 26. Merry Christmas, Giant fans, by the way. That's right. <laughs> you know, at Philly, I'd love to see it. And I think it's payback for last year. Paul and, I, and uh, Paul and I might not get out of the building alive if the Giants win that game by more than 27 <laughs> points, but that's okay. Okay. All right. Wow. I like, I like to go to the one away game a year. I'm not going to that one. Anyway. <laughs> well, then, would you uh, just settle so, for a win in Philly? Yeah, I would. Okay. I'm just I, making I, sure. Pay back in. All right. Yeah. Fi- final one, then, Mark. What else? Uh, uh, the last one, I've done it two years in a row. This is my last time. Lorenzo Carter, 10 and a half sacks. Oh, boy. Well, you know what? I know. You might as well go down with the ship at this point, Mark. Why not? Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, right. Mark, I, I've got so. him as the starting strong side linebacker, which means yeah. he's not going right. to get that many opportunities. Right. But you know, I think he I, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I mean, think of how many guys going... are competing for the weak side linebacker job yep. on the other side of the ball. Yep. There's so yep. many. Uh, to me, I. I don't necess- I don't want Carter on that side of the ball. I want him to be the guy who's going to hold the point of attack, mm-hmm. set the edge, string out the running plays, you know, give the tight end trouble if he's going to try to get off the line mm-hmm. of scrimmage, a lot of jam stuff. I think that's where Carter could really be a r- terrific player mm-hmm. and have a great impact yeah. on this team. I think if he's got that many sacks, that's telling me that the other guys didn't live up to what they need to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That would be bad. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's just an oldie but goodie. I, I saw him a couple of years ago in Detroit. I just love the way he was, you know, getting in the backfield when he was practicing out there. So I figured I'd give it one more shot. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Good call, my friend. Good to hear from you. Guys, I got to tell you, great job on the phones today. We good had a course. lot of good conversations, great comments, good predictions, and it was a lot of fun. Paul, I really enjoyed myself. This is, I think, one of my favorite shows of the week. This was a very fun, fun program. And, and you know what, John? I think the best part about it is we're still early in camp, 
and we haven't seen a whole lot to talk about, and yet the fans are still getting enthusiastic. Yeah. And, I, and I just think that that's wonderful because once we get into the nitty-gritty and they practice in Cleveland and they practice in New England and we actually get the preseason games, man, that's going to be really tasty stuff. Yeah, and look, the fans are into it. They're excited, and we're getting some new names and some new voices on here too, which I always like to like to have as well. So keep it coming, folks. Excellent job. Enjoy your weekend, everybody. Again, the Giants practice in Newark on Saturday night. I think it's 6 to 7.30, if I'm not mistaken. Right, I Paul? believe it is. Sound right? But remember, it's not open to the public, so don't try to show up and go. But we will have coverage for you for that, of course, on Giants.com. Uh, our production crew will take care of that for us out there in Newark, and we'll have highlights and all the other stuff, though. It might just be a bit of a walkthrough. Sunday, the players are off, and then on Monday, we're back with a shells practice, and then our first fully padded practice next Tuesday coming your way. And, of course, stay tuned to Giants.com, the Giants mobile app, and all of the Giants' social media feeds for coverage of everything New York football mm. Giants. We thank Pearson for running the show all week long. Excellent job. Paul, good stuff. We'll talk to you on Monday. I'm John Schmelk. Everybody, have a great weekend.